Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our medical devices registration update. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We will be officially starting at around um, 10.07, uh, just to allow for more attendees to come through to the webinar. So just bear with us.
Apologies, colleagues. Um, we are running a bit late. We're just waiting on our lead presenter and facilitator. Please bear with us.
Melanie, Dr. Dimagazo has joined. Thanks, Leah. Dr. Dimakatsu. Good morning. Good morning, colleagues. Great. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm coming out of Exco. You have the floor. Oh, apologies, I was muted. Um, I, I just need to confirm if our all our guests are on this platform or Am I moving to another platform? No, they are all here, Dr. Dimahat, so you can go ahead. Okay, all right. Okay, firstly, I, I just want to indicate to our colleagues and industry members, um, I like to apologize for being a little bit late. I was called into an agent meeting. I, I profusely apologize for that. Um, um, and I hope we will be making up, we'll make up for the time. Um, so I think I'll start first with the introduction of myself and the team, you know, for the benefit of other colleagues in the in the call that do not know me. I'll just share my screen for a minute. And then I'll switch it off afterwards and then we'll start sharing the slides for today's meeting. Um, my name is Dimakatso Matibe. I'm the senior manager for medical device and radiation control here in SAPRA, South Africa Health Product Regulatory Authority. Um, firstly, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar for today. And um, where the intention of the this today's webinar is to speak to the feasibility study. And I hope that the colleagues had an opportunity to look at the feasibility study. So we have shared on our registration as we published the, the coming this workshop or webinar, we also attached the, the expression of interest with the intention of the industry to, you know, sensitize themselves and know what's coming in relation to the, to the webinar. So since I've introduced myself, I can see I'm freezing. If I may please switch off my, uh, my, my camera. Also frozen. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, so before we can start with the with the proceedings of today, we just want to speak about the the rules of of the engagement. And as indicated, this engagement is mainly for the feasibility study towards medical device uh, product registration, medical devices, including both IVDs and non IVDs. So during the proceedings as we reference uh, medical device, we will be speaking to both IVDs and non-IVDs. Um, you know, and, and we would like this workshop to focus on the feasibility study that we are intending to conduct towards medical device product registration. And as indicated, I'm not too sure if the slides are shared with the colleagues, is that all the colleagues will be muted during the presentation. There will be three presentations that will be shared by the colleagues. And then afterwards, there will be an, a platform open for Q&A. And if there are any questions, colleagues can also put it on the chat and then we will address it um, to after the end of the presentations. So I think, Melanie, with all that said, we can start. We have already, uh, you know, taken 20 minutes into the whole proceedings. So I will place my presentation online and then we'll start with the presentation. Just give me one second. Okay, I'm just about to share the slides now. 
computer is a little bit slow. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. So I will start with the presentation and my the, my presentation will speak to the intention of the feasibility study. Just share my slide now. Uh, Melanie, may you please confirm if you can see that I'm sharing? Yes, uh, please put it in presentation more, Dr. Dimakatsu. And I'm in the office, yeah. Great, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have spoken a bit about the housekeeping, about the question coming at the end, and as well as sharing the question on the chat, and then the other colleagues will attend to that. Oops. All right, and as we pay request, you know, for, for us to have a clear understanding and for fairness to everyone on the call, can we please focus on the feasibility study? We will not answer any question, will not in address any question that is not related to the feasibility study. And any questions related to the application will definitely not answer in this, um, in this um, engagement. Okay. So I'll start now with the presentation. To show if Ndobozo, there is any control that you have. Oh, okay, on my side, didn't want to move. So with my presentation, mainly will focus on the medical device regulation in South Africa. We just wanted, we thought of giving an update first on where we started with medical device regulation until to date, right? The Medicines and Related Substances Act was updated in 2015 and it was, it was published whereby the medical device was added into the act that they will be regulated by SAPRA. Following that, the medical device uh, regulations were published in 2016. And the, as an organization, we followed the WHO global framework for putting regulations in place. We further started doing medical device establishment license. The next slides will indicate, I just took a snapshot from the WHO when you're looking at the medical device or regulation implementation approach. We further in 2017 started issuing the first medical device establishment license in 2017. And around the same time, in May, the, the guidelines were published for medical devices. And our first renewal uh, came in about uh, two years ago already. So it shows that time flies. You know, um, I usually say medical devices this year was it's turning seven years old towards the end of the year, but a lot has been done in the space of time. And furthermore, in the previous years, we, as a unit, we have been engaging with the industry in various topics. You know, uh, last month or early this month, we had an engagement with the conformity assessment body um, towards uh, supporting with medical device product registration. We have also engaged, um, you know, through our finance unit on the fees that also included the medical device establishment um, fees in, and as well as the medical device registration, product registration fees. We have in various, um, you know, uh, platforms spoken about our approach towards product registration through Reliance. So these are the examples that as, 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 a, as a unit we have been engaging industry on. And today, especially on the Reliance, we will be speaking to an approach that um, we will be using towards medical device product registration in the country. When we're looking at, as I indicated, medical device regulation uh, implementation, we looked at various reference approach. We're looking at the MIDRF, we're looking at other national regulatory authority that we are relying on, also using the WHO global model regulatory for medical devices. These are some of the reference documents that we looked at. And I think the colleagues on the call are aware that SAPRA um, is an affiliate of the MIDRF. We are a member of the AMDF. So we are trying to align as much as possible 
to international standard, not forgetting that we have our own legislative framework that we need to comply and align with. So a lot of work has been done regarding the pre-marketing. If you're looking at the basic level of controls and enforcement, um, going towards expanded, I don't know if people have seen this, but going towards expanded. As SAPRA, we have done a lot of work, um, you know, in, in if you're looking at pre-market, we have published the classification um, guidelines that was used during, um, or these are still used with a medical device um, establishment license with by um, applicant or license holders um, must complete and the application form and they must include classification. So the guideline was submitted to support in that. The essential principle guidelines are also were published and then also the requirements of having a declaration of conformity that will be uh, submitted to SAPRA. And this is one of the documents that will be published, especially um, in relation to medical device product registration. We will further uh, publish documents speaking to the labels and the labeling. Um, um, and then when you're looking at the part of the placing on the market, as indicated, we have started the process of doing um, establishment listing um, of medical devices establishment since 2017. We already had our first renewal in 2022. Um, and, and in our application form, we included listing of medical device. And then the next step that we need to move towards is medical device product registration. And this is one of the activities that we are doing that is taking us towards that direction. We have looking started looking at, at vigilance reporting. We have published our vigilance guidelines that the team is currently internally looking into that, and it will be published. Um, it will be reviewed and the comments will be noted and it will be published for, for implementation. So, so these are the some of the activities that, as a regulator, we have been taking into place and implementing with the support towards putting the product in the market as well as post-marketing surveillance. And furthermore, when you're looking at um, the, the act, it also speaks to uh, product registration, including medical devices. And as I'm indicating, indicated, these are the, some of the activities that we are taking into account towards product registration. And when we looked at the fact that medical device registration has never occurred in the country, one of the reason was to look at doing a, a feasibility study. Last year, when we were engaging industry, we were using the word the pilot, you know, and we have our experts from medical device experts to our legal experts that looked at our approach towards a pilot. And then advice came out to say, we cannot call this a pilot. We can look at, because we are still looking at some of the areas to see the, the feasibility of putting a system in place for medical device product registration. So hence we moved from the weight pilot. And I want to emphasize that this is not a pilot, but it's a feasibility study. We are looking at the approach of medical device product registration that we want to put in place. And based on that, it's either we're going to do a pilot and then we're going to do product registration. A lot of work still needs to be done. And when you're also looking at the medical device regulation that was published in 2016, you look at Regulation 8, it also calls to the medical device uh, product registration. And these are the areas that puts us in the mandate of start doing product registration. And one of the first steps that we decided to take on is to do a feasibility study. So as I've already indicated, and with the advice from our legal experts as well as medical device expert committee that we work with, is that we will call this a feasibility study because we want to see, you know, the proposal that we've put forward, if we will be able to implement and, and then um, and start working on the pilot or go directly to the product registration based on the outcome of the feasibility study. What the feasibility study is, it's a voluntary participation and hence we invited everyone. And I think there were some questions and queries on concern of, of us asking the questions. And I think I want to address that now, that we, on our registration, we have requested, we asked three questions. 
to uh, to the participant. And the intention of that is part of engagement. So that is not a one-way communication, but um, the people that are attending the, the, the workshop understand the direction that we are intending to take as a regulator and also to familiarize yourself as individuals and as participant on the questions that we have asked so that when we speak, we speak the same language. We don't have to go and explain what's a reliance, you know. So if you look at those questions. And again, we also wanted, we attached the expression of interest for that reason so that uh, we, we sensitize the industry or uh, the proposed participant to understand what direction we want to take as a regulator. So that document, will, it was in the final draft form so that the participant can know what is coming. And when we speak about the feasibility study, they are fully aware of what we are talking about. And in looking into the feasibility study, as I've indicated, the intention is to look at the, the different, there are different types of registration model or pathway that can be followed. Can be a reliance model, recognition approach, it can be a full product registration. And with this, with the feasibility study, that's the intention that we want to look into. And furthermore, taking into consideration that SAPRA, within SAPRA, we are one of the regulators that has radiation control um, within it. And within radiation control, there are medical health products. So with the feasibility study, we wanted to see how the two units operationally will work together. So the, 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 when we implement in product registration, we also have to take into consideration our radiation control, example, the TB, X-ray machines, uh, for example. So how will we incorporate the two? And that was one of the intention of us doing a feasibility study. And when we're looking at the question of how will this benefit either the industry or SAPRA, is with the us going first with the feasibility study, we will be able to define, um, you know, the resources that we have internally as as an organization, and what is it that we we require, and the outcome of it will be us uh, publishing the guidelines, and also updating our SOP, and then also looking at resources such as uh, human resources. We're looking at online system. Uh, you know, we would have tested that. And and a question that can come is then, what is it feasibility study? Is it for me as an applicant or the interested volunteer participant? For, for us is that it will assist with understanding the requirements, be able to apply the, the guidelines with us, you know, when we are implementing it, clean it up, support us in ensuring compliance to in focusing on the international standard, but also from an applicant perspective, it will be capacity building, not knowing what's coming and also can assist with training of, of personnel. Also understanding that from a SAPRA perspective, there are no fees charged as well. So, um, you know, the studies for, we are aware all of us that there is less capacity for medical devices, especially with product registration, because it's new. Um, you know, it will be capacitating on both sides for both the regulator and preparing uh, preparation for the for the applicant when we start doing product registration and definitely we'll share the report not only for the participant but to the whole industry will post it so that we can share the learnings and and what more what can we do better but it will definitely be a summary report and with the feasibility study we also because there were some concerns about the question about the products it's a feasibility study we can do a certain amount of product at a certain specific period because we must have an end date. We cannot open it up for all the product. Then it will it's, it might as well start doing product registration. But we are trying to we are investigating something here. So there must be a timeline and there must be areas of um, you know that of focus. And with that, we actually approached our National Department of Health and NICD in assisting us with product selection. You know, so that we we, we base our priority according to the national priority a product list. And that's the reason why we have selected only particular product, and we look operationally as well 
as I indicated, inclusion of radiation control in the whole process. So the product must also make sure it is inclusive of radiation control. And I have spoken about, you know, the outcome, some of the outcome and, and the colleagues that will do the next um, a presentation will speak more in depth about the guidelines and the internal processes and how to further, if there are any interested participant, how to engage and then the timelines of the proposed uh, feasibility studies and what are the requirements, because some of the concerns was the timeline as well as how much time do we require to spend on this. So the, 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 the next slides from the colleagues will speak to the how part, if there are any interested participant. That will be my, my last slide. And the next slide will be presented by Ms. Kanye Silenkuku. I'm not sure if Kanye, you want me to, to continue presenting or you will present from your side. Um, I will present from my side, Dr. D. Thank you. Take over. Okay, um, are my slides showing? Uh, yes, please, you can go ahead. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Kanyisile, and I'm the Medical Device and IVD Registration Officer, and I'll be providing an overview of the feasibility roadmap, as well as how to participate in the study, and also the different um, pathways where um, applicants will be looking at in terms of the feasibility study. Um, in terms of the roadmap, this was um, also um, published and um, presented by Dr. D a few weeks ago. So we are looking at first publishing the expression of interest that has already been approved um, by executive committee. And this is the stakeholder engagement that we are holding. And as Dr. D mentioned, there'll be a few guidelines as well as SOPs that will be published in support of the feasibility study. And this will also publish the finalized expression of interest that I will also go into detail with, and they'll be published with the relevant guidelines. And we will also hold applicant engagement with parties that are interested in the feasibility study. Around quarter three, we aim to have applicants already submitting and to start initiating the process of screening, reviewing, as well as evaluating. And one thing to note is that all the guidelines that will be published will be working documents, so they'll be live. So throughout the process of us um, doing the review, there'll be updates because there'll be things that we are learning throughout the process. And we aim by quarter four to be publishing the guidelines with hoping that we have included um, whatever recommendations and amendments that industry has suggested and also to the processes of reviewing that we have seen to publish for public comment. And we aim by next year to have completed um, the feasibility study and um, finalized the guidelines and also our SOPs and to publish um, the findings from the feasibility study. And now, who can participate? So this was posted on the expression of interest draft that was um, published on our social media. The most important thing to note is that you need to already be a medical device establishment license holder with the products noted in the expression of interest. As Dr. D noted, the range of products that we are looking at are IVD and non-IVD that are used to monitor and diagnose HIV and TB. And we're only looking at devices that are intended for human use. So we're not looking at veterinary medical devices. And we're looking at both medical devices that are locally manufactured as well as those that are imported. And it's only high risk class C and D medical devices also, to emphasize what Dr. D says, there is no fee charged from the SAPRA side, and this is a voluntary study. The proposed range um, and types of products that we're looking at, as we said, it's IVD and non-IVD, and we're looking at TB and HIV. And for both, it's imported and local. 
and the number of products that we are aiming for are 32 products. So from both looking at, it'll be the example will be um, HIV antigen and antibody self-test kit. Um, it'll be for TB um, test kit, it'll be x-ray, it'll be male and female condoms. Those are the types of devices that, that we are looking at. And to note, it's only the devices that fall within the GMDN codes that have been published that will be accepted. And there was also a question that came in from um, industry to ask, what about EMDN codes? It's very important to note that you can always link an EMDN code to a GMDN. So the GMDN code that has been published on expression of interest, we're only looking at devices that fall within those codes. And for X-rays, it's also important to know that you need to also be in compliant with our radiation control unit. So you need to have a radiation control dealer's um, permit that will be required. And now I just want to um, clearly um, go through the different registration models that we are looking into. The first one is the Reliance Pathway. The Reliance Pathway that we are looking at, it's for recognized um, regulatory authorities that SAPRA is um, in, in relation with. So it'll be conformity assessment conducted by in-country accredited conformity assessment bodies that are ISO 17065 or notified bodies in Australia, Brazil, Canada, the EU, Japan, UK, USA, or WHO PQ for IVD, and also registration certificate or market approval by Australia, Brazil, Canada, um, EC, US FDA, or WHO PQ certificate. And these are all referred to as originating approval. And when we look at the process for record for these recognized student virtual authorities, the process will be for the um, license holder to establish a quality, quality management system, according to ISO 13.5, ensure that they have their license, uh, medical device establishment license with activities conducted on site. And also, um, most importantly, ensuring that the devices are listed on the establishment license and they are approved for class C and D for those specific products. The AR authorized representative has to ensure that they have evidence of accreditation, um, recognition of a conformity assessment body, and also product specific regulatory registration or market approval. The next step will be for them to prepare the application and the technical dossier for them to participate in the study. And there will be the technical dossiers applications that will be published along with the expression of interest. And once submitted um, to SAPRA, we will then um, review and we'll communicate any queries and also the outcome to say, are you accepted to participate in the, in the study or what is outstanding? For the registration model that looks at the South African assessment part, whereby it's medical devices that are manufactured in South Africa, or those that do not hold market authorization from a jurisdiction that was mentioned in the previous slide. The process for these ones as well ensure that they have established a quality management system according to ISO 13.5 and also ensure that they do have a medical device license and the products are listed on their license. They will then need to do a conformity assessment body review. So they will arrange for assessment of the medical device conformity to ISO 13485 and the essential principles of safety by a CAP that is accredited for ISO 17065. After then, they will prepare the SAPRA technical dossier for registration in the, for voluntary um, submission in the study and submit that technical dossier to SAPRA. We will review and also communicate the outcome. So this process looks at the decision tree to see will you will like how do you partake in this um, feasibility study? The first question will be to ask, is your device a class C or D? If it is not, it will not qualify 
to participate in the study and it will be rejected. If it does fall under class C and D, you'll need to ask yourself the question, is it imported or manufactured um, by a holder of a valid establishment license holder? As mentioned in the previous slides, you need to already be a medical device establishment license holder for you to partake in the study. If it's a no, you'll be rejected. If it's a yes, the question to ask is, is the importer manufacturer now also, are they, is it valid? Is it expired? Because we also have instances that currently there's a lot of renewals that are happening. If it's a no, you'll be rejected. If it's a yes, the question to ask is that, is the medical device authorized for sale in one of the recognized jurisdictions as in the previous slide? So does it follow the reliance pathway or will it follow the essay um, assessment pathway? The, the pathway, you need to be very clear when you are submitting as well, because we will not be deciding for you. You need to submit evidence. If you say it's a reliance pathway, the onus is on the applicant to submit evidence that it is following the reliance pathway. And now how to participate? We'll be publishing the expression of interest with the technical dossier and guidelines on the SAPRA website. And this will be published by the beginning of May 2024. And this is, I just wanted to explain where you'll find the expression of interest. As much as we do publish um, what is happening as well on our social media like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, but also most importantly to always get the documents on our website. So when you go on the SAPRA website, you'll go to About Us, and then it'll show you um, a few things. There's, there'll be expression of interest, and that's where the expression of interest that's finalized, as well as the guidelines and how to submit, and the end date will be published. And the interested parties, they need to submit the following. So it's a cover letter that has the name of the medical device establishment license holder, as reflected on the license, that is very important. The name and the contact details of the authorized representative. Also, it needs to be aligned with the license. Activities for which the license holder is authorized and licensed to conduct. And so to import class D, non-IVD. And then they need to also provide the details for the medical device that they wish to submit for review in this feasibility study. So they need to provide the full product name, type of device, GMDN term number, and also the term name, the risk classification as per the SAPRA guideline, the intended use as per the IFU, the market status of the medical device. Is it on the market? Is it a new medical device that's not yet imported into South Africa? Or is it uh, manufactured in South Africa? And also for imported medical device, the originating approvals. So as um, noted in the reliance pathway and all for medical devices that are locally manufactured um, certification status of QMS of the license facility and also any other market approvals or authorization that is held for the proposed medical device. And this information should be sent to the email address mdreg at sapra.org. ZA. So applicants don't have to wait for the expression of interest to be published. You can already start submitting all of this information to say that you are interested in partaking in the um, voluntary feasibility study just after this webinar. And the process will be that we will acknowledge each and every interested um, expression of interest that is submitted within five days. We will do an administrative review of each um, expression of interest and identify and communicate any queries or missions or queries that we do have. And we'll respond within five days and we'll send you confirmation that you've been accepted to participate in the study or non-acceptance with reasons, of course, of why you are not accepted. And the um, selected participants will then be are told to send through the technical dossier via a close link that will be sent to each and every authorized rep that has been accepted. And most importantly, I just wanted to draw in into the checklist that um, we've been told that is 
not on the expression of interest, but it was on the expression of interest to say that when you are submitting the technical dossier, kindly do ensure that you do go through this um, checklist and ensure that all the information is there and it's referenced correctly. Um, yes. And these are the working documents, the guidelines that will be published um, on the website with the expression of interest. Most importantly, will be the technical dossiers and applicants need to use the correct one. If your product is an IVD correctly, you need to um, complete the correct technical dossier. If it's a non-IVD, um, complete the correct one. There's also the proposed guideline for registration. This is also one of the important key guidelines that will be working um, in progress as we do the feasibility study to ensure that we update as everything goes along. Um, the classification guideline as well that should be used, the essential principles as well. And we have a few template authorization templates, marketing declaration and declaration of conformity that as well will assist in this feasibility study. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Lydia will be the next speaker. Good morning, everyone. My name Lydia. is Lydia Motlohelo. Lydia. I'm the, yes. Lydia. Yeah, well, let me firstly clarify something um, as I'm, I'm chairing the meeting. Um, I just want to speak to one point that uh, Kanye spoke on, on the conformity assessment bodies before we move to your presentation. The information of the conformity assessment bodies will further be shared and included in the expression of uh, interest as well, so that our um, colleagues who are interested in participating in the study can engage them, especially for the locally manufactured product or product that are coming from the non-reliant countries. So the expression I just want to bring in that clarity will be part of the expression of interest that is published. Uh, Lydia, you may share your screen and please start uh, presenting because you are not sharing your screen. If you may share your okay. screen. Okay. Over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll just share now. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lydia Mutlochelo. I'm the Medical Device Registration and Clinical Trials Manager. I'm going to speak about um, what we expectation on, uh, of the outcome of the feasibility study and the way forward. So our expected outcome and learnings of the feasibility study, we will definitely share a summary report at the end of the study, um, uh, outlining our learnings. We will define and decide on the registration framework. We will be able to identify and develop registration guidelines as my colleagues have already indicated. We will define and establish registration timelines determine any additional resources required for product registration process. And um, as is, this is a feasibility study, we're not doing pilot or registration. There won't be any product registration certificate issued to the volunteers or participants. Um, I, we want to reiterate that we will definitely share a summary report. And then uh, the feasibility study will lead to medical device product registration. And then when we look at the way forward, as indicated, SAPRA will publish expression of interest by the beginning of May 2024. Drafted guidelines will also be issued during the study, will be published as a working document until finalized after and during the study. Interested parties are supposed to submit their expression of interest 
as indicated by my colleague Kanyisi Lengugu. Further engagement of licensees who have volunteered will be set up and will be ongoing. Uh, we expect the study to run uh, about 18 to 24 months in order to establish expected results. Engagement of interest, interest uh, conformity assessment bodies is still continuing. And then how to contact a uh, medical device registration team, especially the interested parties. All interested parties to email us at uh, medreg at sapra.org.za as indicated by uh, Ms. Nkuku with the relevant documentation that she has indicated. And then the attention will be towards me, uh, Lydia Motlohelo a meeting and engagement to be set up. And then um, we will have a close meeting with the volunteers or interested parties. So we can uh, go back to queries if we there are any queries. I'll end here. Thank you very much, um, Lydia. And thank you very much, Kanye. Um, I think now we can open up the platform for questions or any queries or point of clarification, if there are any from the colleagues. I'll hand over back to Melanie and Takozo to assist us with that, if there's any, to allow for that. Thanks, Dr. D. Mics have been enabled. Thank you. So I don't see any hands, I don't know from my side. So clearly the communication was clear, I hope so. There are no queries. Oh, Dr. Okay, D, then. there are questions on the Q&A platform. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. There is also one hand uh, that I see. I just wanna go to the Q&A. Um, the colleague can come in, I think it's Chris. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Chris. So the with the conformity assessment bodies, there's an it says in country. What what does in country mean? Okay. So as indicated by can you or maybe I'll allow the presenter to be the one that speaks to that. Can you if you may assist with that response? Okay. Um, so in country refers to the conformity assessment bodies that have been recognized by SAPRA and um, accredited by SANAS. So these are the conformity assessment bodies that will be assisting with um, reviewing technical dossiers for local manufacturers. So it, it's not the, it could be the international ones, but they've gone through recognition to SAPRA and accreditation to SANAS. But the... That's, I mean, SUNAS is required and SAPRA recognition is required for the, the local establishment 13485, right? The international medical device manufacturer just needs to have its own 13485 assessment body. It does not have to be the same assessment body that would be evaluating a establishment in South Africa. You're correct. It does not have to. Remember, the, 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 we have increased the scope. We had an engagement with the conformity assessment body um, about three weeks ago, as I indicated. So we have increased the scope of our conformity assessment body to now even support in technical dossier review. So the conformity assessment bodies that we're referencing to, they're not only looking at the quality management system of an establishment, but they will support us on that. So, and the intention of us bringing this conformity assessment body is to also consider local organization or manufacturers who have not shared their um, technical dossier or who have not registered their product outside of the country so that they are also catered for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see on the platform, I'm not too sure if you have addressed it. There is a question from Khadija, but before maybe I go to the platform, any other question as I go through the platform? Okay. 
So there is, please clarify, participation in this feasibility study will not result in the registration of the product and the participant will still need to submit for the product registration while the, once the final registration process are implemented by SAPRA. That's the question. Uh, thank you, Dr. D. Um, yes, that's correct, Khadija. So this feasibility study will not um, end in you receiving a registration certificate. So once um, the once the caller plan is um, published and registration commences, all the applicants who also took part in the feasibility study will still need to submit through their technical dossiers for registration. Thank you. There's another hand to see. Uh, Simone, if you may please come in. Thank you. Uh, for the oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for the informative um, um, information or well, informative um, presentations that you've given us. I think it's really exciting times, and it's the way that we've been looking for. We're desperately looking for registration. My question is: If we get, as a local manufacturer, registration of our products with Bomra, will that be recognised as a registration? Reliance in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simone. Bomra at the moment is not one of the organizations that we are relying on. And uh, based on the latest knowledge that we have, Bomra has not started doing product registration except looking at the reliance method with WHOPQ, which is also when we're looking at our reliance model, we will be following that part as well. So Bombra has not started doing full product full product review as an organization. But maybe I can add to that, looking at the list of the countries that we are relying on, we are also looking into extending or adding more, but we will uh, have a criteria on how to add additional countries. But at the moment, Bombra is not one of them. Thank you. Back to the chat because I was at the hands. Um, Simone, you may please come in again. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a lot of discussion around publishing of guidelines. So my question is, there's a lot of guidelines that you've put on the presentations. Will these be shared with industry as commentary, published as commentary first? Or are you going to publish and then wait for comments to come for amendments later on? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm not too sure, Lydia, or can you want to take on that one? Yes, I can come in, Dr. D. So the guidelines will be first, uh, they'll be work in progress drafted documents. So they'll be published with expression of interest. It's only after um, the feasibility study, they'll be published for public comment. So they won't be finalized um, until we've done the feasibility study. So we'll publish them after the feasibility study for a three month comment process review, and then we can start implementing them. So the publishing through the feasibility study, they won't be yet be implemented. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another hand. I need to go to uh, Khadija and then Sarah afterwards. And then afterwards, I'll take two from the Q&A. So Khadija and then uh, Sarah. Um, can you see Lick? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, uh, just to clarify, on some of the guidelines, we had provided previous comments. Uh, industry did provide them last year. Say, for example, on the IMDRF TOCs. Were those, will those be considered when you're publishing them? Or will they only then be considered together with the further comments that come from this feasibility study? 
Um, thank you, Karija. So in us, before we um, publish these guidelines with the expression of interest, we did go through all the comments that were provided in the previous um, public comment publications. So there are some um, of the comments that we did incorporate and some of them, of course, that were not taken into incorporation. But with the feasibility study, it's also to ensure that, you know, we see uh, what about the things that we have not considered, are they feasible within the study? So throughout the feasibility study, there might be some things that you also see, and also you have greater knowledge to say why something should be like this, as you see deemed in the feasibility study, that we also hope that um, industry will, you know, emphasize on that throughout this feasibility study to ensure that when we do do public, um, do publish, the implementation, everything has been taken into full consideration once we do implement. Thank you very much. Can you, uh, Sarah, if you may please come in. Thanks, Dr. Matiba, and thanks for the informative presentation to all the presenters. So a couple of questions from our members. Firstly, um, has SOPRA made provision for the fact that the technical, do technical dossiers submitted during feasibility will be different to what will be submitted after call-up, as Class Ds will be under MDR by then? Has there any thought been given to that? Um. The collab will be under MDR. I, I don't understand. What do, you, what do you mean under MDR? Well, the Class D devices, particularly, yes. will be under the RVDR, sorry, under RVDR. After so the call-up, yeah. So what is the expectation now? Because now we are just doing the feasibility and the requirements will change under RVDR by the time we go into the call-up phase. Sarah, I think that I'll be direct with you. That's a European system that is taken by the European mo uh, model to follow. We okay. are also looking, as a member of the MIGRF, we are looking at also the table of content if you're looking at the document that we are publishing. So we cannot okay. only align with one, um, one, we are not only servicing Europe. We also have okay. products that are coming from different mm. um, jurisdictions as well that we have to, hence the reason why we joined or being an affiliate member of the MIDRF so that we align as much as possible uh, with international standards, not individual country standards. All right. You, you, Thank you okay. for clarifying. Yeah, that's helpful. And then will you be accepting the state version at all as part of the tech or instead of a technical dossier or not? For when? Now for the feasibility. We will publish a, a document that we are requesting organization because remember it's a feasibility study. Okay. And based on the outcome of that, then we will report on what is the way forward. Okay. And then, sorry, my last question around the revised regulations that we are waiting for. What is the impact of that on the feasibility? Uh, or will that come into play after the feasibility is over? Do you have any updates from the DOH? No, they have no impact on the feasibility study. Okay, thank you. Uh, as I indicated, maybe Simone, if you can hold on a bit, as I indicated, I will take other two questions from the floor and then you can come in afterwards. Thanks, Simone. Um, there is a question from Melanie. I'm not too sure if I'm clear with it. So I'll ask Melanie, uh, speaking to the 17065, if you may please come in and pose your question, please. Hi, Dr. Matibe. Um, yes. I was just wondering if the um, feasibility, the ISO 17065 review that is needed for the feasibility study, if the information about that is going to be published to industry shortly. The reason I ask is that it's not something that local manufacturers are familiar with. So we would be kind of finding our way in the dark without that guidance document. Yes. So with the local conform local conformity assessment bodies or recognition, we'll be working with SANAS directly, and they will be sharing guidance with us on what we publish and not to publish. So as as they as they it's their mandate from from that perspective. But we will be working with SANAS in the process, and then they will be assisting us in publishing the guidelines related to that. 
Okay, so there will be a document that local manufacturers can access in time for this feasibility study to show them where to find these CABs and what process to follow. Yes, and as I have, yes, exactly. And as I've indicated, we'll also include the expression of interest because we have engaged with conformity assessment body to be part of the feasibility study. So the conformity assessment body, both local and international who have shown interest will be included in our publication. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. And there was another question, so I'm going in line according to the time with, I think the guideline, with guidelines expected to be published in September. What? With guidelines expected, will I think it's will guidelines expected to be published in September, will a pilot, okay. Uh, I'm not too sure, Siama, but I'll try and answer the guideline question on it being published in September. We'll publish the guidelines as we indicated, it's an ongoing or working document. So any, the guidelines will will publish as we go and will a pilot follow, we will communicate the next step after we look at how the, 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 the feasibility is going. So we cannot say after this will be a pilot and then it will be registration. So based on the outcome of the feasibility, then we will communicate with the industry. Um, before I go to Sabelo Simone, you may come in, please. Thank you. So I have two questions. One is around what Sarah was saying. So if, and this applies to local manufacturers as well. So we're using the technical evidence requirements because there's no set format for Europe or America. So we have dossiers in, in that format, which is not in the format of the IMDRF draft registration document that was published. Um, so my question is, would that dossier be acceptable for the feasibility studies? Uh, or, uh, so I want clarity as to whether we now have to retype it into the South African format. And the other question around that is that when I did the COVID, I mean, the COVID uh, ventilator project, there was a chapter 104 that we had to fill out. So I'm not sure whether that's still going to be applicable. My second question is around 17065. I've noted on the Irish regulatory website that they've got 17065 certified conformity assessment bodies, because um, as we know, FDA don't follow that because they've got in-house um, in, um, assessment teams and the CE follows the notified body assessment teams. And on the Irish website, there is not one single medical device certified conformity assessment body to 17065. Um, and so I wondered if you could maybe just clarify if medical devices are actually explicit in that standard. I have not actually seen the standard. Thank you. Yeah. I think, Simone, in that question, I'll refer it to SANAS because I cannot speak to the expertise of the 17065. So I will start with that point. So for me, I will revert this question to our SANAS colleague to support. And as to why there is no Irish in the Irish website, the MDN IVD, I cannot speak to that. I, I honestly cannot speak to that. But the question on the 1765, I will revert it and send it to our colleagues and signers to support on that, and then we can share response. The one on the, we are publishing the table of content. We have published it before, and we that's the reason why we're calling it a feasibility study. And, and the intention is to implement the table of content as the administrative documents to be used for submission. Um, and if you're looking at the US FDA, actually they were doing a study with Health Canada in implementing the TOC. So with a feasibility study, that will be the administrative document. We have published it before and we want to see that is it feasible to use. That's why we're doing the feasibility. And the COVID-19, I think that you spoke about 1.4. I'll ask Kanyisile to support on that. Uh, Dr. D, before that, I think Moko want to answer uh, Simone. Oh, okay. 
Oh, thanks, Moko. I see. Thank you, Moko. I didn't because uh, there's a lot of people saying thank you very much, Moko. You can come in. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Dr. D. Uh, for 17065, basically, I think if the Irish accreditation body or any accreditation body does not show that there are any conformity assessment bodies under 17065, that means they probably they have not yet accredited anybody. But that does not stop, even if there is new scope like this one, it does not stop the already accredited body or no non-accredited bodies that are that are seeking accreditation to, 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 to apply for accreditation and it will work in line with how they have um, implemented or, or structured or established their system in line with ISO 17065, then including the scope that they're looking at. Even if it's this medical device one, then they have to align with the scheme requirements. So uh, not having any accredited body on the website does it means it just means that uh, there are no no bodies that have sought that have that has have sought accreditation for that particular scope. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, Marco is our colleague from Sanas. Thank you very much for the support. Really appreciate that. Thank you. So I'll take other two questions online. It's from Sabello. Please confirm there will be no performance evaluation by the National Ref Lab testing for the feasibility study. Um, I think I, I would like you to raise your cab in uh, Sabello and maybe clarify that point. I don't want to make assumption out of it if you're still in the call. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear Good me? Good morning. Yes, we can yeah. hear you, sir. Yes, Doctor. I just wanted to confirm there will be no testing uh, for 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 the for the feasibility study like we did during COVID nineteen, and there will be no like sample provided for for lab testing. Thank you very much for the question, um, Sabelo. So when you you submit your product technical dossier for registration, there will already be if it's a for example a product that is manufactured locally and you have used the local um, labs for testing, it will be part uh, of your technical dossier submission. At this current moment, we are not uh, doing any uh, external as an, a regulator, any performance evaluation um, external from the feasibility. So we are looking at the process of us receiving. And I think that you're raising a good point. If we're going to do any performance evaluation, there will be a rationale behind why we're doing a performance evaluation on a specific product when we're doing product reg registration. And that will be communicated as to why this particular product. There was an issue of substandard product with COVID-19 and falsified product coming into our market and hence a decision that was taken. So I hope I've answered your question, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if if you do not get enough participant, what will happen? Are you going to consider other medical device? Uh, anonymous, yeah, um, you know, the intention is 32 product is a lot as it is already. Uh, and if we don't get enough uh, product, we'll deal with the, we'll, we'll cross the road when we get there. But at the moment, we are hoping that our industry would like to go through this process with us as a regulator and both of us will learn. So, you know, I cannot answer and say, yes, we will do. So we'll, 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 we'll see at the outcome of today's meeting and then we'll take it from there. I don't see any hands, so I will. And uh, there's Mr. A.D. De Beer. Will this study eventually lead to the possible registration of plastic with no originating approval EU FDA? Yes. That is the whole intention. Uh, I think in answering your question, Mr. A.D. De Beer, his question is, will this study eventually lead to the possible registration of Class C and D product with no originating approval EU FDA? Yes, if you're looking at the model that we are uh, putting across, yes. Uh, there's another hand, so let me check with that. Before I go to another question, is Robin, and then I will also allow Wendy. So it's two hands. Robin, and then 
afterwards, Wendy. Robin, you may please come in. Hi, um, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask about the time frames for um, dossier submission. Um, because it says the interested parties uh, to respond within five working days. So will we have enough time to engage with our manufacturers and medical writing team to um, assemble our technical dossier in the format of the TOC? I think maybe, we, no, no, no. I think maybe you might have missed that. It's the showing your interest in participating, okay. not submitting. Yes, the five okay. days is just, yeah. And then we'll have a close meeting as Lydia indicated with uh, interested parties. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Wendy? Are you are muted, Wendy. You may come in, please. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, no. we can hear you now. Um, when they actually get to doing the feasibility study, are there sufficient panels available for the non-specifics and the interfering substances for these tests to be tested against? Because that's generally a problem that's, that manufacturers are having, is to getting the panels. Um, remember, we are looking at the product that has gone through all the tests and it passed the test. We, as I think one of our colleagues asked if we are taking the product for performance evaluation. And as I indicated, we will be receiving a full dossier. And I've indicated when do we only do performance evaluation. So okay. the organization. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. So if they are um, registered overseas, that technical dossier will stand. It has to be the same product, yes, depending yep. on whether it's no, coming fine. from the. That, that's fine. Thanks. It depends on which country is it coming from. Okay, now that, that is CE. I need Thanks. to quickly. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, I just need to quickly go up and people can raise their hand as I go. I was at uh, Mr. De Beer's question. Since the feasibility study will inform the registration process and assist the develop, will the final medical device regulation wait until the feasibility study is finalized or is that independent? It is independent. Uh, Chris Ilex. Why full? Okay, I think Sarah, we have answered you. And then Sabello as well. Uh, if someone wants to raise their hand, they may please. Okay, Janita, I think Lydia shared the good day. What platform will be used to submit all the data? Lydia, you can come in on this one. Um, once we have uh, the volunteers during our close meeting, we'll advise them on in terms of the platform. And then um, they will be given a way how to submit on that platform. Okay, I think the, the 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 question on the feasibility study is only limited to HIV and TB. We have explained that one. Um, okay, Chris' question was answered as well as Khadija. I think that was the last one uh, from the questions, and I don't see any hands raised and any other question coming through. Uh, with all that said, colleagues, I just want to go. Uh, Robin, you have your hand up before we can go towards closing. Hi, just a quick one, um, which I know the manufacturers will ask. Um, is there a confidentiality agreement between um, the, the different stakeholders, including the conformity assessment body, so that if we submit our documents, then those documents are safe? Yeah, so Thank if, you. thanks Robin, if it's a reliance approach, the documents are coming directly to SAPRA, so they're not going to conformity assessment okay. body. Right. For local manufacturer, it will be an agreement, the technical dossier that they will share with the, with the conformity assessment to sign. Mm -hmm. They will sign a conformity assessment body, I mean, a declaration. And I would like to believe the 17065 will also speak to the integrity and also the declaration, um, you know, of how the conformity assessment body must, um, 
you know, uh, manage the the documents that is submitted. I can't speak on the conformity assessment body, but I believe that they such. But then, obviously, then they will submit to SAPRA, and then the declaration will 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 will, will do the play. But for international, they don't submit to any caps. It comes directly to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moko. You may come in, or I think maybe Moko can support on the other part. Oh, just to support you, Dr. D, on that, uh, uh, ISOIC 17065 also talks to confidentiality, how the confirmatory assessment bodies are able, how do they keep the information with clients, with their own clients and all manufacturers uh, confidential. So it, it has to be looked into. So during the assessment, we also looked into that as well. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And this one. Hi, Dr. Matibia. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for the presentations. My quick question, I know the question on if we don't get enough uh, volunteers. My question is the opposite. In the case where you then have maybe more than enough or more than the 32, right, is there a criteria that you would use if the, uh, I suppose, the total number that's above the 32 all meet the the criteria in terms of the decision uh, line. Is there an additional uh, criteria that you would use in terms of prioritizing which one you would accept or not? I'll hand over this to, oh, Moko, you have your hand up. You want to address that one or should I hand over to Kanye? Your hand is still oh, up. No, no, no. Well, it's still up. It's <laughs> one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I was like, okay, Moko, you can tackle that one. Uh, can you, do you want to assist on this one? And then I'll come towards the end of it. Okay. So um, thank you, Andiswa, for your question. So upon discussion, um, we have discussed on what happens when we do have a surplus of applications that all meet the acceptance criteria. And um, that will be also now dependent on the resource availability and also the willingness of each and every stakeholder to work with SAPRA. And there is an understanding that some of the interested parties might be too busy, so they might not be able to have the engagements that we require. And those are some of the criteria that will also be applicable in terms of deciding on do we continue with an applicant or do we not? I think you have answered it uh, for me. I don't have to add anything. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any hands. Um, I didn't see any new uh, Q&A. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see any new one. So with all that said, colleagues, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for taking your time out in attending the, this meeting and also participating. That was the whole intention uh, for the meeting to be an interactive meeting. It's not a one-way stream. And as I indicated, that's the reason why we shared the expression of interest beforehand and the list of the guidelines that we will be publishing so that when we are making presentation, because obviously presentation is a summary of what is the intention, but at least you would have been exposed and understanding and be able to ask questions on something that you have seen before. And um, we are looking forward to more engagement as this is a new route, road for all of us. Um, and we'll continue engaging regarding the process. And as indicated, uh, we will be engaging with uh, people that are volunteers that are interested in closed meetings. And we'll write a final report uh, upon finishing the, um, the study, and then we will publish that. I think before I close, I see two hands, Simone and Andiswa. Um, thank you, Dr. Matibe. Can I just ask, is it possible to get a Q&A document out of this meeting that we can share with the many other mem um, um, applicants? Um, is that possible? Thank you. That's a good point, uh, Simone. We can do that and we can edit. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you very much. Andy, so you may come in, please. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Uh, that's a very good point, uh, Simone. I also wanted to maybe check because some of the questions that uh, maybe may have been put during the signing up for this uh, meeting 
might not necessarily have been addressed. I don't know whether there was an intention to address. Perhaps they could then be put together in that uh, document, Q&A document as well. My question is around the the questions uh, in the questionnaire for signing up for this meeting, right? You had a question around grouping. I'm assuming at this yeah. point in time, you're not considering it or is it still an option? Um, we intentionally asked that question. <laughs> Um, because it's, it seems as if we, we don't want to do groupings and, and we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the understanding of grouping? Because we, we, that's, we understand that, you know, the, 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 the registration of medical devices, you can do it in grouping. So we intentionally put at that question and we are considering grouping. Not for this study, the, right? Not for this remember, study. Yes, oh. exactly. And we, we oh, can okay. receive it. Remember, we are, okay. we, are, we are doing a study with feasibility. That will help oh. us to see how to handle that. Okay. No, then that, I think that makes it a bit better. Maybe, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. I uh, see. I don't see any hands, and I don't see any questions. As I indicated already, thanks to Kanisil and Lydia for preparing for this. Thanks to our colleagues who are on the line who have been working with us uh, towards this uh, MOCO. Uh, thank you very much, and other colleagues that uh, I know that they have worked with us in presenting and preparing this document, and also the presentation. Our colleagues from communication, and Togos and Melanie, thank you very much for your support as well. Uh, through the whole past weeks in preparing for, for today. Um, nothing else from my side. Um, based on that, I will deem the meeting closed and have a great day to everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.